All right, everybody, welcome back to our podcast. Thanks for joining us again. My name is Tiffany Herlin. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And today I get to interview from Discovery Ranch South Residential Program, Nate Marble, who is the Performing Arts Director. Today in this episode, we will be discussing specifically performing arts and how it can help a student gain deeper insight into their therapeutic journey. So I'm excited to have you today. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Discovery Ranch South. Uh, so I, like you said, I'm the performing arts director. I, I I tell everybody I'm from northern Utah. I grew up in Wyoming and eventually ended up at UNLV uh, studying performing arts and arts. Uh, in the arts program at UNLV, there's a program where you can teach while you're going to school there. And while I was teaching undergrads, um, I kind of developed my own studies into the performing arts. So that's that's kind of my background, but I'm here at uh, Discovery Ranch South to be the performing arts director, like you said, and kind of give these kids an opportunity to step outside themselves and learn more about themselves. That's 30 seconds. There yeah, you go. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah. I, well, we're going to dive more into my next question leads into this perfectly is sure. what exactly is expressive arts therapy or performing arts? There, there's a lot of different kind of ways to look at performing arts and expressive arts therapy. Um, my whole basic theory behind it is that in order for an actor or somebody to perform on stage, they really have to know who they are at the core. Yeah. And in order to discover that, it's, it takes a process, of course. And a lot of these kids have no experience being on stage, being in front of people. Um, and that's hard. <laughs> it's not easy to get up on stage. And so to give, I mean, to give them the opportunity to learn a little bit about themselves while they're um, exploring these different art forms like the dance, the the art, the music, all of these different things and programs that we have at Discovery Ranch South um, teaches them a little bit about themselves. And I'm really just here to guide them where I think they would most benefit from, if that makes sense. I took a training from Dr. Um, Bessel van der Kolk, who writes the book, The Body Keeps a Score. And he talks a lot about with experiential therapy uh, in regards to processing um, trauma and, you know, other things that are stored within the body, how this can be such a powerful tool for people to be on stage in various aspects, like you were saying, and explore different parts of themselves and maybe process difficult things as well. I don't know where I'm quite going with this. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a few things that you touched on that okay. I can I can go into. First, in order to play a different role, yeah, to act, you I've always said that acting and performing arts therapy is probably the best empathy and sympathy training you can have. Oh, absolutely. Because if you step on stage in a different role as somebody else, you have to be able to see that world from their point of view. So you have to step outside of yourself, first of all. You have to this is I mean, getting away from your core to find out what somebody else's core is, mm. that core character. And so even in dance, uh, I have some students that just at the beginning of their program sit in the background and I go ask them, I say, you know, what's what's going on? Why aren't we why aren't we getting up and trying to dance? And they're just like, I just don't do that. But by the end of the program, inevitably, they're finding different ways to express themselves through dance and yeah. we have them they're up on stage they're learning from the instructors that i have that we have here and they're they're moving their body through dance in a way that they probably have never done before and so it's it's to get them out of this day-to-day -day, every day what they do and put them in a situation where they might be a little uncomfortable but in that uncomfortableness hope that's a word in that <laughs> in that <laughs> uncomfortableness uh they're able to find something out about themselves and they can take that with them if it, you know whenever inevitably when they leave here they're able to take that with them and and decide if they want to use that later too and so the dance side of that's one da one part of it um well let me just yeah jump in real quick it. it's so great to hear that i mean dance is a very vulnerable thing mm -hmm. you're taking your body and doing something that you could look really silly doing mm -hmm. right and people could judge you and you know but at the same time 
you know, it's such a great way to release scenes that you're storing in your body. I mean, it's from a therapist point. I'm like, I love dance. I grew up dancing. I, yeah, it's been therapeutic for me. I always, I taught dance for many years and always joke like, this is my therapy. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is mm-hmm. my time. There's really nothing more beautiful to me than somebody who has lost themselves in movement. Yeah. And it's not just dance movement. Like part of arts, the arts program and performing arts is movement in yourself. So the body language aspect of it, but, but to see somebody lose themselves in a dance, which you've probably experienced yeah, and everything outside of that world disappears, everything outside of that person, they're just there moving. Yeah. And that's, that's gorgeous to me. That's beautiful. Just to be able to watch somebody get lost in that. Um, it's kind of like one of those Pixar movies. What was that? Where they're in the oh. zone. Yeah. I've had those experiences personally, and I was talking about dance being my own therapy, Mm -hmm. is that there's been times where I've had a really stressful week and I've gone to teach dance, and I get lost in the music and lost in the movements, and I kind of come to you at the end of class and I'm like, I was really stressed. Like, what was it? What was going on? Like, it's like this release and this escape for that, Mm -hmm. for that time that I get to connect. The other thing I was going to say that just came back to me is that we were talking about in our first episode of the series with Jennifer Hedrick about how as adults and as even teenagers and kids, we learn as a society to put up self-defense mechanisms cognitively. Mm -hmm. And we're really good. Sometimes in talk therapy, uh, I'll have clients come in and they're just really savvy at what to say. But they don't always apply it because yet when you're challenging them, you were talking about allowing people to be challenged in performing arts and you're putting them in a situation that is uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and let's say quote unquote perceived threats. There's nothing threatening about performance arts, but you know, if you're worried about what people are going to think of you Mm -hmm. or you're going to be embarrassed or make a mistake, that's a perceived threat, right? You're allowing people to reprogram their brains and to, and when they do well at it and they succeed and overcome, even if it's a little thing, like I was scared to get on stage and sing, Mm -hmm. but yet I did it. Maybe I didn't sing well, but I didn't No one made fun of me. It's like your brain goes off like, Oh, like, and it creates a neural pathway Mm -hmm. and allows them to explore other parts of themselves. Right. They didn't realize they had. Yes. And moving from like, I believe that one of the main aspects of performing arts is really is just a study of body language as a, pertains to relationships. So if I put somebody in a situation, I, I, body language is huge for me because I believe down in deep inside, whatever is happening on the inside is going to eventually happen on the outside. So people, you watch people, you can see how they're feeling about any given situation. You and me sitting here talking, you can see if they're, if, if, or in any conference, you can see if people are interested in the conference. You can, by, by watching that. So when I bring kids into the, the performing arts studio or room, um, we really delve deep into what they are giving off personally, just walking around campus, yeah. walking around this area. And I point it out to them. And that's very uncomfortable to be seen. I mean, you know, we talk about our parents' seminars. Some of these kids have never danced before. They um, stand up on that stage and do that dance in front of their parents, and they've never done that before. But it's a very therapeutic form of, I would almost say, pride that, look, I did something outside of my comfort zone. And so to point these body language aspects out and then say, how's that serving you right now? How's that serving you with your therapist? How's that serving you with your family? Especially if they're like this. Exactly. During yeah. a session or yeah. like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is that serving you in the moment? Yeah. And not to say, I mean, body language can be manipulated. Yeah. You know, but somebody who's watching that would probably be very closed off. If you're going to be closed off like that. Yeah. By the way, my listeners who are not <laughs> yes. seeing this video, yeah. I was turned back, turned towards you and arms crossed mm-hmm. and head down. Mm-hmm. Right. So mm-hmm. sending off a lot of body language. Too. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's one thing, those neural pathways you were talking about, that's one thing people just don't realize it, especially these kids at this young age. They've built these mechanisms, like you were saying, these, the these walls, ones, these yeah. defense things. They've manifested in how they're reacting outwardly, and how are those things translating within this group? Is it serving you? Could I change that? Not, I hate to say to get what you want, but can I change that to 
better myself in any situation. To facilitate to faci- more open relationships or that change. are yeah, yeah, change relationships to be more beneficial for both people, right? For both, yeah. right. And again, pe- you can tell when people are lying. Yeah. You can tell <laughs> when people are trying to fake the body language thing mm-hmm. on my end. And to be called out on that, like I said, is that's kind of heartbreaking because you're like, oh, I didn't realize I was doing that. <laughs> it took me until my my second year um, in my master's program, I used to be really closed off on stage. And one of my directors says, why do you do that? You're diminishing yourself. Because I'm a big guy. Yeah. I'm Again, for the people listening, I'm 6'2", 240. I can be very intimidating. If I wanted to walk into a room and open up and just intimidate people, I could. And then a director comes to me and says, you're really closing yourself up on stage. You've done that forever. Why are you doing that? And it's because I didn't want to intimidate people. So what's that giving to people? That's saying, well, he's diminishing himself. Why would he do that? And to me, that was like mind-blowing. It was like, you know, I'm playing a role. For instance, I played John Proctor in The Crucible. And John Proctor was a farmer. He was very religious. He was could have been intimidating. So closing myself off, crossing my arms, mm-hmm. turning away was not serving that role. I had to stand up in myself, claim the stage, claim the role and be that person. And again, that sympathy and empathy for that person taught me about myself. Every role I played in college and afterwards and in any role I've played, I've learned something about myself, not just about that person. And that's what we're trying to do with these kids. Yeah. Put them in a situation where they're like, this is not comfortable. And I don't want to be here. And I've had people that have sat in the corner (laughs) through the whole class. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I talked to them about it and like, why? Why is that uncomfortable? Why don't you want to be here? But eventually we come to, okay, this is something that you're learning about yourself in this moment. So let's try it. Nobody's going to laugh. Non-judgmental. Performing arts is a very non-judgmental place. It's a safe space for them to try new things. Yeah. I love that. And as a therapist, you know, it, it's so much more powerful to put a client or a student in a situation in performing arts that would help them gain deeper insight versus us just saying, hey, you're really closed off. Let's talk about that. Right. Right. You know, like right. you can only go so far with cognitive words at mm-hmm. that point versus having them act it out or showing them their body language because that's that's what we do in therapy. We point out to our clients scenes that they're doing that are, they may not notice and may be a disadvantage to them and say, Hey, do you want to change that? What do you think of this? You, I'm now making it, I'm shining light on this mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you may not be aware that you're even doing it and mm-hmm. it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. So what do we do with that? Right. Yeah. What do we do? And I've had it on the other end too. I've, we've had scripts in class and there was an experience with one student here that um, they were nonsense scripts. So they didn't make any sense. They were just words on a page. Yeah. But there were two people going back and forth. And I was saying, okay, I want you to do this angry now. I want you to do this happy. I want you to do this sad and just see what the subtext of all of that is. Let's see how it, how it reads, you know. And we talk about boundaries in therapy a lot. Well, this, this student did it angry. Okay. But it was only to a level. It was to a level that they were comfortable with. <laughs> And I said, okay, now I want you to take it a step further. You're on like a level four angry. I want you to take it to a six. They tried, take it to a six. And I said, listen, I want you to just be ticked. I want you to be as mad as you can be. And they looked at me and said, I don't feel comfortable doing that. And as me, as a director, I'm like, I want you to. (laughs) We're going to push you to it. (laughs) But with these boundaries, I'm going to respect that and say, okay, Maybe that's something you would like to explore in the future so oh, that you can okay. see where that goes, right? Because yeah. if I'm trying to play someone that's really angry, but I'm not willing to go there myself, it's not going to be believable on stage. Sure. And we talk, you know, Shakespeare, all the world's a stage. It's yeah. not going to be believable in the real world. Now, I use anger because that's a very powerful emotion, but that could be anything. I want you to take it to a level 10 sadness. I want you to, and pe- some of these kids have never experienced those emotions. So how do I get them to draw those so that they can experience them, be in that place so that when they experience them in the real life, in the real world, it will come and they'll be like, okay, I recognize this. Do I want to go there or do I want to pull back from it? Well, you're teaching them to be vulnerable in a safe space Mm -hmm. because a lot of times 
when the students that we're working with, they've shut down, mm -hmm. they've numbed, they've found outlets to navigate their uncomfortable feelings. And when you shut down those feelings, you shut down all feelings, yep. right? Yep. You can't just shut down anger and sadness. You also shut down joy. Right. And so helping these kids experience all emotions, not as good or bad but to just experience them and open themselves up is allowing them to be vulnerable, which allows them to connect, which allows them to overcome shame, which allows them to grow and heal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. okay, you got you and I are geeking yeah. out over all this stuff. I could yeah. talk to you yeah. for hours about yeah. this. Totally. <laughs> like, yeah. I, uh, there was one other theme that you said. I just loved it. I was just envisioning, um, I, have you ever seen the sh show Ted Lasso? Oh, yeah. I was just, I um, there's a character and she talks about how she gets really big before mm -hmm. she does something scary. And for those of you who can't see, but she like goes in the mirror and puffs herself up with these claws and like la like uh -huh. a lion, like yeah. <sighs> You know, like, and, and she does that because it helps. I mean, you and I know what that does. Yeah. What does that do for yeah. someone to do that body language before well, something scary? That gives you, first of all, it gives you power because it, in your own mind, because you're putting your, your body, there's two different thoughts towards acting. There's inside out acting and outside in outside in is what she's talking about, where you put your body in a state where it is huge. And that hopefully yeah. translates to the even, inside, yeah. right? It I just, can even feel that when I do it. Yeah. It makes you feel good. Yeah. It makes, it makes you feel powerful. So when that she in, in particular was talking about walking into a room of men, Oh, right. right. Because, because of that whole dynamic. Yes. Right? Being and a woman. She was the, the only one. World. Yep. She was the only yeah. owner. So she walks in and she has to find a way to put herself technically in their world whatever their perceived world is she's putting herself in that position because to them she could they could be the same thing to her yeah. they could be these huge monsters just overpowering and she has to put herself in that position before she even walks in or else she's she's gonna be sitting in the background right we could go off the rail of so many different conversations let's back up just a little bit okay. for our listeners cool. what different types of expressive arts therapy are there we've mentioned a few but let's talk about maybe a broader range i mean some of the stuff that we explore here uh on the ranch is of course like we talked about earlier dance yep uh we have dance classes every week for each kid so they come um to us and, and do that we we have music we have two different things of music i mean our first class of music is is a guitar and percussion class and i teach that percussion class and it's fun to just watch kids get out their frustration on a bucket oh, we yeah. do we do bucket like street performing bucket drumming awesome and to see that the kids just like i need to get this out right now so we're gonna stomp and we're gonna hit this with a stick for a while <laughs> is really fun um of course and then we talk about music uh, as it pertains to a group um we have a band here so it's a cover band that the kids and some of these kids have never played instruments before they've never sang before um and so it gives them a chance to actually work as a group because if, if we all know that if a band's not playing as a group it probably won't come off very well and we know? all know that working with a group can be frustrating sometimes oh, yeah. and oh, teach totally. us a lot about ourselves yeah <laughs> yeah especially in this in this atmosphere yeah. you know uh, because you have to learn in order to do that if the bass isn't doing right the drums are going to be off if the drums are off the keys are going to be off the singer's going to be like where the heck are we so mm -hmm. we've got to We've got to figure out how to do that as a group. Um, you've got literature. I try to work with them at least once or twice a year on maybe like a slam poem or something. Mm -hmm. But um, that is very personal, too. Uh, they'll de dig deep into maybe an experience that they've had, and I, I want them to write that out, and they, they share that with the group and um, some of these things they've never talked about before. So it gives them a chance through poetry and through literature to be like, okay, here it goes. <laughs> I'm just going to lay it all out on the line. Um, let's see what else. I mean, just pictorial art. Yeah, you know? that's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. As a therapist, when I'm stuck with a client mm -hmm. and we're not making any headway, uh, I'll often switch gears and keep them on their toes when they come in my office and hand them some medium. Uh, whether I usually like looser medium, so not pencils or markers, because I've learned that when you you dive into paints and mm -hmm. say oil, oil, um, pastels mm -hmm. it, it actually 
helps them open up more. Yeah. Uh, and they have less defense mechanisms with yeah. it, with that part of their brain. And I'll have them draw a picture and they'll be like, why are you making me draw a stormy sea with a boat and a lighthouse? You probably know where I'm going with this. Something yeah, like, yeah. yeah. And me standing on a cliff because every client draws it differently. Yeah. And it mm-hmm. all tells a story of what they're doing. And then we discuss it and I point out what's going on and ask some insights. And they're like, Oh, oh I see. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm in the storm. We I've had clients put the lighthouse under the sea. Oh, wow. And it's like, and I don't tell them where to put it, you mm-hmm. know, and it tells like, oh, so there's no hope for you right now. Like, wow. and they're like, yeah, I don't feel like I have any hope. So that type of stuff I love. Yeah. I'm like, it just starts so many conversations yeah. that they wouldn't normally have. Yeah. And, and I've found that in the, in the journey, like even one of the best fun things that I love to do is just give them a thing of clay and be like, all right, do whatever you want. Yeah. Because it's in the journey of it. They're, they start molding this clay and then all of a sudden they start talking. They're like, hmm. And they start talking about things that you wouldn't even expect them to talk about. And so you're around a group with, with six or seven kids and they're all talking about personal experiences. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I get you a little bit more yeah. now and why you're at where you're at. So that... I mean, the three-dimensional art, the spatial art is, is really fun for me, too. Well, that's a looser medium, too. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's not this concrete medium. It, it has movement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so there's drama, art, music, mm-hmm. dance, uh, literature, poetry. I mean, I'm, the list goes on. Yeah. Uh, who is... <laughs> We're jumping around, but this is really fun. I'm enjoying this conversation. Good. <laughs> good, um, good, good. Who is an ideal client for expressive art therapy? That's a really hard question because I don't know that there isn't, there's not not an ideal client, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I've, I've taught people from, like I have a, a student in, in one of my classes in town right now that is 76 years old and they're expressing acting. They've never done it before. And then I have students that I've taught that are eight years old. Um, so there's not an age range. It's not an experience thing. Uh, what I've found is that um, – Anybody who has forgot how to pretend, really, and and we discuss that too. Like, what? When do we forget to pretend? When do we? You know, I've got my theories, but when we stop going out to recess and playing kickball with our friends, and when we're, you know, I believe arts, art, arts can teach so much more. And pretending, and so I had this seventy-six-year-old guy out there cleaning. He, I was like, "What did you pretend this week?" And he says, "Well, I was cleaning up a lot next to my house, but I was pretending I was a stormtrooper in Star Wars." <laughs> I I'm love like, it. But we forget to do that, and I think the pretending is where the creativity happens. Um, so, really, I don't know the answer to like the perfect arts therapy person. Sounds like anyone. Really, anyone. It's. Anyone who needs to build more positive experience and really find themselves Mm -hmm. in a safe space could really benefit from this. Or get back to the basics. Yeah. Get back to the very simple, like I was, when I learned, when I really sunk into this for myself, I went home and started playing dinosaurs with my three-year-old. And that, I was like, I haven't done this. That was when I was probably 34. I'm like, I haven't done this since I was a kid. Um. And that was really touching for me because I'm like, oh, this, why can't I have it both ways? Yeah. Why can't I go to work but then still enjoy, you know, and pretend and imagination, imagine things. And it's kind of beautiful in that aspect. It's so beautiful. There's a really cool theory that is a foundation of this. It's a broaden and build theory of that we have negative and positive experiences and the negative experience evoke a specific reaction. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with this? No, but I I keep you going because I want to hear this. Okay. Yes. So when we're scared, we run, right? We have fight, flight, or freeze. So mm-hmm. when we're angry, we fight. You know, mm-hmm. The list goes on, but it's very narrow and mm-hmm. it's specific. Now, when we have positive experiences, it opens us up to um, a variety of things. Like there's no exact... Uh, action that comes from a positive experience. It could be a number of things, which leads us to build further character and confidence and have more resources. And so experiential therapy and specifically performing arts is allowing um, them to face process negative and difficult emotion in a safe space, but then also hopefully have those positive experiences that broaden them, allow them, it it induces creativity, play. Um, It just, 
it, it, like I said, it broadens and, and builds, which mm-hmm. is exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. And that's really what we want as therapists is to broaden and build our clients to realize like there's more than just this initial knee-jerk reaction to defend yourself, which are important and necessary, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but there's more. There is, yeah. And that's the wonderful thing about performing arts, especially the acting side of thing, because you hear about method actors all the time. Well, there's probably a hundred different methods to get to be an actor. There's different ways to approach this part. One of them is like the Alexander technique where it's all about neutrality and you have to find neutral before you can do anything on stage. You have to find neutral so you have a blank slate to work on. And there's another one that's uh, Michael Chekhov who's all about finding an emotion and then using that emotion to completely engulf it into your body and all over. Uh, there, you know, there's hundreds of them. And each one of those would pertain to a different person or kid or actor or anybody in a different way. And they would use, so that's, that's what I love about it is there's no one right way to it. They can use all of that to get what you're talking about, to open yourself up to possibility either on the positive or the negative side. And then once, once they see where those are, they can sit in it, realize it and say, do I want to be here or not? I think that's the biggest thing is like the realization that they can choose. There is no good or bad. It's all just is. Well, and that they get to rewrite the end of their story, yeah, yeah, right? Or yeah. they get to rewrite the end of their play or their script. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. they're in control. I, oh my gosh. I, I just love, <laughs> love this topic. Um, let me ask you this question. What are the goals of your students participating in expressive art therapy? Or have we touched on that already? I mean, we've, We've touched on it. I mean, the real goal is just to have them participate. Um, and and I've really just found that they're not willing to participate unless I participate too. I mean, mm. um, the people in the room that they're looking to at the most, they need to see some kind of form of reciprocation in it. Uh, but I think the real goal is just to push them out of the comfort zone and have them do something that they would not normally do. And in, in doing so, that journey will help them learn about themselves hopefully if they're open to it yeah so again growth doesn't happen in comfort Mm -hmm. growth happens in challenge and change on the fringe yep on the fringe and so it sounds like such a great opportunity for them to to be placed in that situation Mm -hmm. how does expressive art therapy help students gain deeper insight into their therapeutic journey here uh, the biggest thing that I've found is is that emotion, uh, like we've talked about. There's a, there's a book called Tuesdays with Maury. Love that book. Isn't it great? Oh, it's, it made me cry. I've read it a bunch of times. Yeah. Love uh, it. For those of you, it's, it's about a professor who's nearing the end of his life. He has ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Yes, I think so. Um, and one of his students comes back and just asks him a bunch of questions about, about life, um, philosophies, all of that kind of stuff. And one of the main things that I took, it's a really quick read, but one of the main things I took from that book was Maury said in the book, he says, when you feel an emotion, don't hide from it. He's like, don't hold it back. He says, the minute you hold it back, you're just like putting a bottle cap on something, right? He says, the minute you feel, ang- like we talked about angry, the minute you feel anger, instead of holding that anger back, fully feel it. Let it engulf you. He says, let it just wash right over you do whatever you need to do in that moment so if it's sadness feel sad let yourself cry let yourself roll up in a ball on the floor if you need to because the next time you feel that emotion like we've talked a little bit about this you'll be able to recognize what that's there okay this is sadness coming up what am i going to do with it you'll be able to sit in the moment uh self-realize realize what you're doing what's happening with yourself and say this is sadness. Do I need to take a walk? (laughs) Do I need, instead of pushing it away again, um, and just denying it, it's there because it is there. You're not going to deny it's there. It's curiosity, not judgment. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And I talk about the difference in our classes between feeling and emotion. Uh, the feelings are, and we always come up with the same definition. (laughs) It's like feelings are on the inside. Emotions, how you express those feelings. At least that's what, yeah, you know, I love that's it. kind of the research that I've done. And so we can hide our feelings from other people. We can hide that anger. And, you know, I've done it with my kids all the time. <laughs> if I, my, oh, yeah. my personal kids, you know, I have four daughters. I can be angry and not show it through my emotions. 
that might not be healthy for me. <laughs> I might need to find a way to get that anger out somewhere else instead of on my kids. Um, but eventually it's going to come out. Uh, it usually comes out sideways too. Mm, it's what I true. tell tell my clients. <laughs> yeah. Well, explain that. Cause like, um, it's like, I like to say like it's like a soda can being shook up, right? Those bubbles are in there. Mm -hmm. And the more you don't open it and allow them to breathe, you know, like a normal soda, um, if you shake it, it's going to build and build and build. So when you do open it, it explodes everywhere. And who knows where it's going to come out of depending on where you open it, right? you know, and it explodes. And so that's a lot about emotions, right? Is it, it comes out in ways you don't want to man, like you've been holding it in for so long that it's just going to come out how it comes out and you don't really have any control, even though you've been trying to control it. It's mm -hmm. a little counterintuitive, right? Yeah, it's, that's totally true though, because those emotions, like if emotion is happening here at work that I am very, that something's happening inside of me, that will inevitably come home, come out at home probably against someone that I really love that I don't mean to bring that emotion out against. So yeah, the, the ability back to Tuesdays with Maury, the ability to be able to just sit in it for a second and say, how do I want to deal with this in that moment instead of closing that bottle can and, and shaking it up is probably the biggest, I think the biggest lesson that I could give uh, through the performing arts. I love that. I think that's such a great example. I think, um, in regards to more application, uh, I also see that expressive arts is a great way to role play, um, not only to model behavior, but also expose fears, process deep, you know, difficult emotions, learn new coping skills. Um, and be basically, you said it much more eloquently <laughs> like than I was saying, but it's just a safe environment to explore all these scenes and develop new ways of coping, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's what, I mean, improv. We talk about improv and acting as well and the ability to just come up with something on the spot and having to feel you have to drop an emotion at the beat of a hat. You talk about Romeo and Juliet. We might This might be a segue. This might okay, be something okay. completely off, of <laughs> That's course, okay. right? That's okay. Go for it. But I've always had the discussion because uh, I was in Romeo and Juliet. I was Capulet. I was uh, Juliet's father. Um, and we have this discussion about Romeo and Juliet. They see each other, not 10 minutes, but they're automatically in love. So... Is that possible? Is love at first sight a possibility? Hmm. And we have this discussion and inevitably we're like, okay, love is an emotion, right? Something you feel on the inside. Can I feel anger at the drop of a hat? Yeah. If somebody does something against my kids, I'm going to be mad. Yeah. Or fear. I can feel fear at the drop of a hat. So if those are, if those are all in the same aspect of love... Why couldn't Romeo feel love for Juliet at the drop of a hat? And this is all stuff we're learning through acting. We're, we're learning through portraying somebody who lived, well, they didn't even live. You know, John Proctor didn't even live. They lived in the, they would have lived in the 1500s. So there's no way we would have known exactly how they felt. But emotions, I think, are universal. Mm -hmm. They, they kind of span all of us. They span all the continents. Um, so yes. I think emotions are kind of the key. I forgot where we're going on this. No, no, I like but. it. Emotions definitely are the key. Um, and they are, it's one thing as a therapist, you know, I can have someone say, well, you've never been through this exact thing that I'm going through. And I can say, yeah, you're right. I haven't. Yet, I know you feel fear and sadness and, lo and loneliness. Mm -hmm. And I felt those too. Maybe not with the exact same theme. And you can still connect with people, and which leads us to empathy, mm -hmm. which leads mm -hmm. us to being seen and heard, mm -hmm. which leads us to connection, which leads us to healing. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so what a beautiful way to experience that in a safe space with uh, experiential, or, you know, excuse me, um, performing arts. Yeah, either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we've talked on this, but how does expressive arts help nurture teens with mental health challenges? Okay, so teens are in such kind of a volatile situation. Um, teens, this is where they're really, really learning who they are. Um, ex I do this exercise every once in a while, and this is really the core of everything that I teach and what I want to teach is we talked about positive and negative experiences before and how you react to each one of these. Mm -hmm. I have kids write a T graph with a positive on one side and a negative on the other side, and then... All of the things that affect their lives, I have either put in a positive or negative category. 
And then the ones that do the most, the ones that affect our lives the most, I have them put a one, two, and a three by each side, the ones that are positive, the ones that are negative. And then I have them what I call swarm around me. So they're just walking around the room the whole time. And I give them an opportunity. I play some music and we do a little piece of device theater and I give them the opportunity to speak those things. Because a lot of times, and you can get into some pretty deep stuff in just three words. Oh, yeah. But inevitably, those kids are the ones, when they're speaking those things, there's at least one other kid in the group that speaks the exact same thing. Really? And they don't know that. Teens don't realize that other teens are probably going through the exact same thing they're going through in that moment. Mm-hmm. And the things that are affecting their lives for the positive, things that are affecting their lives for the negative, are happening in everybody in other people's lives in that room. It's so it, they're in this volatile state, and if you give them the opportunity to say, "Oh, I see you," mm-hmm. you know, and it, be vulnerable, be vulnerable about it, speak them loud. I don't let them speak them soft. <laughs> I'm like, I play this music loud. I want you guys to use your voices and get it out into the universe, into the room, whatever it is. Um, that's why it's so important for teens. They have to experience that so that they know that. Other people are experiencing the same thing, and all it takes is a pat on the back sometimes to say that I see you, you know. And, and that you're not alone. Right. Which is all we really need and want to hear at mm-hmm. times mm-hmm. when we're going through something really painful and hard, which mm-hmm. is what the teens who come here are, are going through. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't be coming here. Their parents wouldn't be sending them here unless, you know, if they didn't have something really painful and hard that they may, may or may not want in their life. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. They're, they're struggling. Right. Right. That's so beautiful. Can you share a success story that you've witnessed over your your time working here at Discovery Ranch South with one of your students through performing arts? Yeah. um, I was working with this student not too long ago, and they they graduated not too long ago. um, And they were actually on a different side of the experiential program at first. um, But they had... Uh, something happened to their ankle, so they came into the performing arts side. Um, and at first, I was we, we were coming up on our performance on our parents' seminar variety show performance, and I was just having they were I knew they were a great artist, so I had them paint some backdrop a backdrop for the show that we were coming up because they were kind of in it in it late, and uh, we only had two or three weeks, and I couldn't really put them into the show, so I had them paint, and then. Through one thing or another, I learned that they wanted to try to sing. Um, and they were progressing through the program, and they were almost done. And um, So I said, okay, I want you to sing a song for a variety show. And they looked at me sideways and like, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that at all. And I said, yeah, you can. Pick one. Let's, let's figure it out, and let's do it. Um, so they did. They, they sang for our cabaret and then our variety show. And they loved it, and their parents came and saw it, and their parents, uh, when they decided, when they were ready to go home, uh, they came to me and and said, thanks for finding her voice. Um, Thanks for helping her find her voice. We're getting her voice lessons when she gets home. And I'm like, that's what it's about. It's like just helping these students find their voice through the performing arts. because I think at times they think they know their voice, yeah. but I think at times they have a skewed perception of what that voice is. And so if we can pull them into something that is new and speaks to their soul, speaks to their whatever's inside and gives them that opportunity and give them that voice, that's that's the goal. That's the real goal. You just made me tear up hearing that. I mean, that's really ultimately what we want um, as therapists is working in this industry is helping these kids feel heard, seen, which allows them to feel connected and can heal and to find themselves again. Because yeah. a lot of times they've lost themselves. So mm-hmm. helping them find their voice, um, that really touched me. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. It's been so I, I want to talk to you for an hour more, but we'll <laughs> we'll spare our listeners. Maybe you and I another can talk day. off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, another time we could dive more. There's so much to say about this topic, but ultimately, um, performing arts is so powerful. Uh, and just personally, I love art. I love dancing. And I've performed, seeing, you know, um, studied it, and it's just a powerful 
tool to, and a safe way to express yourself and find yourself and work through difficult emotions like we've talked about. Such great themes. Um, In our next episode, we'll be meeting with Jennifer Hedrick again to talk about the next steps when you feel like you've reached um, the end of talk therapy and what next, and you're ready to possibly look for residential treatment programs like Discovery Ranch South. And so stay tuned. Look, we're looking forward to talking about that. Thank you so much again for joining. Is there anything else that I missed that you wanted to to say? I don't think I covered a lot. Thank you you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. (laughs) 